life is change. We think we have control and we don't. And so those that find ways to support themselves to adapt and change thrive. And those that block it and try and anesthetize their way out of it have less joy and less success in life. Yeah. And it's with the volume turned up in the time of Corona. Yeah, for sure. So how have you coped with the pandemic and the last few months? I've been I've been up and down. I mean, I've been very lucky. I wasn't in a city, so I was out in the country, which was really good. It, the pandemic hit just as my book launched. So everything in some ways was wiped from my diary, but because it's my work is about change and the process of change and supporting people through change, I was incredibly busy. But I could sometimes I'd feel like the Jaws music, doom, 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 coming through my system. And I had to say to myself, am I going to take my own medicine or am I going to kind of do all the things? You know, all of us have default modes of coping with difficulty. And most of the ways that we cope with difficulty is to avoid it. So don't think about it. Don't process it. Just in in my case, it's always to get busy and feel like I've got agency. And so I actually did take my own medicine. So I was busy, but I also made myself take time to exercise, to uh, my daughter and her children, her family came into lockdown with us. Um, So we were all together, which was really nice. And it, you know, has its ups and downs, everyone being under the same roof. Um, And I did some meditation and, but being in nature was the big thing. So seeing the spring, being outside, and I use that as my kind of restorative aspect to deal with the up the heightened response to both being very busy and the fear of the not knowing. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting of you to share that. Um, There's a couple of things you said there. One of them is that we've all got our default mode of coping with any big change, which I definitely want to explore with you because as you just said, you, you made yourself busy and many people just chuck themselves in, don't they, to make themselves busy. Um, in some way, that's a, a form of avoidance, a form of distraction, so you don't have to look inwards. But the other thing you said, which I'd love to explore, is that you like having agency. Do we not all like agency on some level? So to go with the busyness, I think busyness is an anesthetic. So it stops us feeling. When you're busy, you're, you go to your kind of um, thinking part of the brain and your capacity to really feel and emote kind of lowers so that when you're busy, you're kind of on all the time. And for change, to process change, we need space so that you can feel because oxytocin is the kind of feeling safe hormone in our bodies that tells us that we're safe and through that oxytocin that allows us to feel safe to think to reflect adapt change and thrive when we're very busy we can go at different gears so I mean if you're really in trauma and terrified you're in sort of fourth gear and you don't change at all you're just on alert as you know very well fight or flight or freeze and you're not able to think but you can have lots of there's a spectrum of it But at a sort of, say, second gear, you feel enough to kind of be able to function, but you don't um, adapt or process or make sense. And you don't feel very much because you're distracted the whole time. And so that can make, yeah. Yeah. Distraction, I think, is, I think it's something that we all do. I think it's... uh, you know, in, in some ways, I, I sort of feel, Julia, that it's never been easier than now to distract ourselves. We've got this real conflict, haven't we, where we've all been put under, you know, pressure in a way that we've possibly never felt before. Um, certainly, I know in my lifetime, I've never experienced anything like this. And actually, what we want to do on one level is kind of sit with those feelings, see what's coming up and processing them. Yet, the flip side to that is we've got endless ways now to distract ourselves, whether it's Instagram, YouTube, Netflix, books, podcasts, whatever it is. 
Is this something that you think is problematic for society as a whole at the moment? I think it's whether you do it in awareness or out of awareness. So listening to podcasts, scrolling through Instagram, when you're choosing to do that is a perfectly fine pastime. I think what I'm talking about is that, yes, you're right, we all do want agency. We do. Some people have more sense of their own agency than others, but I think we all want to feel that we can affect change in our own life and affect the life that we want to kind of have a goal that we're heading for and that we can make the choices and from informed information to get there. But also we don't like discomfort. So my kind of big message is that pain is the agent of change. And that's through grief when you're grieving someone that has died or a living loss, which a lot of the pandemic has been. So there's been obviously 45,000 deaths from the pandemic. So that is grief from death. But there's been multiple living losses, loss of structure, loss of jobs, loss of trust in tomorrow is going to be the same as today, loss in health. Many, many aspects of our kind of trust in the world have been turned upside down. And my kind of message is that we can't fight those feelings, you know, because if you squash them, they come out sideways, they come out in a different way. And they tend to come out in our relationships or in our bodies, you know, our mind and our body are completely connected. So that if we give ourselves time and opportunities to find out what we feel and find ways to reflect and feel it, sort of loss orientation, if you like, then we can have restoration orientation where we watch Netflix, we have fun, we drink, we do the other stuff that's engaging and not such emotional intensity, or it might be emotional intensity if that's what we want, but you allow space for both and one doesn't knock the other out, that you hold both side by side and move oscillate between them yeah it's it's, as you said it's the intention behind with which you're doing it right so many of i guess my patients i'm guessing your clients aren't aware that these behaviors are an effort to change their state an an effort to not go inwards and uh, you know not to feel pain not to feel pain but at, at least and i think your book which frankly is is such a good book. Um, it's it's what what I think is well. There's so many incredible things about it, but the the way you put so many case studies in, I think is genius because we all nobody really likes being told what they could do differently or better. But when you when you kind of see yourself in other people's stories, that that is incredibly powerful. Uh, so thank you for writing such a helpful book. Um, but it's, it is it is that intention, isn't it? It's, and I think that's what your book gives. One of the key things it gives people is an awareness, an awareness that, oh, I'm acting this way because of my childhood or because of this or because of that. And I sort of really like that because, you know, without awareness, change is very difficult, right? It is very difficult. And I mean, the thing with the case studies is that I think the most personal is the most universal. So that what we recognize in the stories, and we're all storytellers and story listeners, when we, you know, a lot of people have told me in my book that when they read the story about someone that's nothing to do with them, say in the health section, and there's nothing wrong with them, but they see aspects of themselves, they kind of surprised. And that is, I think, is very powerful. And I think a lot of, you know, the work of therapists isn't about fixing people or making people better in the same way as what you talk about as a doctor in a way yours now, your work now as a, as a GP isn't prescribing and giving, you know, diagnosis and then prescribing. It's working out the whole picture of the person and helping them find their own way yeah. to manage what's going on in their lives. And some of that is what they feel in response to what's coming externally that they have no control of. And the other is using information to know themselves so that there's a, a better alignment between who they find themselves yeah. to be that's been influenced by their genetics, by their environment, by their stories, by all those things, 
and what they can do. I mean, we don't have control over everything to match that with how they live their life. Yeah, it's, as you were sort of saying that, it, it got me thinking about my life as a doctor. And it, it's really interesting. You know, I went to medical school. I, I trained to be a medical doctor. And, you know, I tried many different things, you know, working in hospitals, training, doing specialist exams, moving over to general practice. But one thing I've really understood, and I, I, I really wasn't taught this, I I think I've shared this story once before on the podcast, but it's, I remember the first week in general practice, um, I I think it was a a young lady came in and she basically was really struggling with her mood. Um, You know, she was feeling really low, really indifferent about things. And, 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 like this is, I think this is my first week as a GP, and I, I knew so scary. it is scary, right? And I was a, I'm also a lot younger then, and so you know, I actually sort of feel that you need you need quite a bit of life experience, <laughs> really. You know, like in this country, we can we can go to medical school. I really seventeen, coming up to eighteen, well, you could come out twenty five, even twenty two. You can come out as a junior doctor, and. I think I was 22 or 23, I think, or something like that. And now I think back, what did you know at 23? (laughs) Did you know anything about the world to actually try and give people advice? You know, it's... it's, You must have looked 12. Yeah, well, (laughs) you know, it's it's really interesting. And I just remember with that that lady that I thought, well, I can see the guidance here. I can see the protocol. And I, I think I looked at thinking, well, I think I'm meant to start her on an SSRI, you know, which is an antidepressant, a very common form that, that is often prescribed. But something in me felt, it just, it just doesn't feel right. I don't know what's going on. So what I did, I, 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 I chatted to her. I listened to her without judgment. And I let her talk. And I went overboard. You know, it was probably 20, 30 minutes with her. You know, cues building up outside. And then I said, look, um, can I see you again tomorrow? Can I have an appointment tomorrow or the day after? And I would see her regularly that week. Then once a week, she came in just to chat. And you know what? After four weeks, she was like a different person. And I didn't get it at the time, but on reflection, I thought all I did for her was provide a safe space for her to tell her story without judgment. And I guess in many ways, Although I'm not trained to be a therapist, as I'm sitting across, you know, one of the UK's leading psychotherapists, I sort of feel what I was doing was being a therapist to her. You definitely were being a therapist to her and and being true to yourself. And, you know, love is strong medicine. And I think listening, listening to someone fully to what their body and eyes and what they're showing you, what they're telling you, what you kind of sense underneath is unbelievable medicine. And that your capacity to show compassion and empathy and listening enabled her to listen to herself and give herself the compassion that she probably didn't have when she first walked through your door. And then she could begin to work out if she was actually depressed or what was going on. And, you know, you know, like Johan Hari talks about, a lot of depression is about disconnection or disconnection yeah. from yourself. Um, and so, yeah, love is strong medicine. Uh, and that's what you gave her. Yeah, and it's, you know, sometimes I wish I'd become a therapist. You know, yeah, I, I can up. see that. Yeah, I, I really do. I think, God, I'd want to be a doctor. <laughs> there you so. go. Are there, is, there, is that not the, the human condition? We all, the grass is always greener on the other side. It's like, oh, if I did that, then, you know. um, I wanted my daughter to be a doctor and she's a therapist. There you go. I was going to make her the doctor I wasn't. And she was not listening. There you go. There you go. Well, we can explore that for sure. (laughs) Um, I want to just, I just want to go back in time a little bit. So, um, well, the two things are popping to my mind. The first thing is, I think I've heard somewhere before that you used to run a decorating business. Yes, that is good research. Right. So I'm thinking, I've, I've only known you through your books, and I think both of them are fabulous. Um, and obviously we share the same publisher. And I've, you know, I've been a big fan, actually, of, the, of 
what you talk about and the work you put out there. But then I always, I, I always think, and and I'm slightly biased on my own experience, but I think I have seen this quite a lot that the people who I think make the best therapists or the best doctors, I re- I've got this strong hunch that typically have been through stuff themselves, because I I, I you just cannot learn some of the stuff that we do. I don't believe you can. I think you can teach, you can learn principles at, you know, therapy school or medical school, but I'm not convinced now that that is enough to make you good at what you do. You have to, I feel, maybe maybe saying you have to is a little bit, a little bit harsh, but I feel it's helpful to have gone through your own journey in some way. Now, and I think everybody suffers, right? I, yeah. Very few people. I mean, I can't think of anyone I know that hasn't suffered. Is what they do with the suffering? Is that's what you're talking about? I guess so. Yeah. It's it's. Uh, do you distract from it, or do you go to it and go, okay? Well, I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn from this because, like, even on a on a dietary level, let's say the doctors who I find now consider food to be medicine and use food with their patients are actually when you go and talk to them. Often they've had their own health concerns or, you know, they've had their own revolution by changing the way they ate. And therefore they are passionate about sharing that, you know, with the world on social media, but also with their patients. But I'm super interested as what happens between running a decorating business. It's being one of the country's leading psychotherapists. What's, what happens there? So I think the roots are always earlier. So I was one of five children, two sets of twins. So I've got twin sisters and I'm a twin and a middle sister. So there were five children in four years that my mum had. Two sets of twins. Two sets of twins. This is before you could have Clomide or IVF or so. My mum was what my dad called a breeder. (laughs) Very um, tactfully or very sensitively. Um, So, and I'm the youngest of five. So I think there were lots of things that influenced me, like all of us, you know, we're all walking wounded in some way if we're in this business, I think. One of which was being the youngest and smallest of a kind of big um, family, I learned to listen and I learned to observe. And that's what taught me a lot. So I didn't speak that much when I was a child. I spoke a bit at school. Um... And also I worked hard. It was the thing that gave me a feeling of control. So I have always worked hard, that kind of feeling of, I I always did my prep, I was always on time. And that, I think, gave me a sense of stability and order in a house that was a very old-fashioned way of being brought up. But it was often, there there was so much that was going under the waterline that I was chaotic and uncertain and unpredictable that I couldn't understand. So I kind of gave myself these disciplines of always working and kind of being good, if you like. Um, But also my parents, both of them had had very significant losses, deaths before they married. So my mum, by the time she was 25, her mother, her father, her sister and her brother had all died. And my dad, his father and his brother. So there were you know, their most closest family members were all dead and there were just these black and white photographs right. around the house of people who I vaguely knew were relations. I didn't know they were my grandparents or my aunts and uncles. Um, but what I learned from that, kind of when I thought about it afterwards, is that they kind of believe that what you don't talk about doesn't hurt you, that get on and move forward. You know, that grieving is isn't something that you do. It's something you get over and you don't remember and talk about the person, but you just forget and go forward. And I think that shaped me to do the reverse, basically. Not in a bad way. My parents were very much a part of their generation and they had to survive. You know, post-war generation, that's the only mechanism they had and they had no knowledge of talking treatments or grieving or... So I think they did a really good job. Yeah. But luckily, we know a lot more now. It, it's fascinating that uh, for, for two things, for two, two things really come up in me when I when I hear that. One is we don't really talk about our feelings, and that strikes me as something that I guess 
The British, we've been very proud of in the past. We've got a stiff upper lip, which I'm not convinced anymore is such a good thing. Um, that's that's that's. Uh, uh, let, let me put it more bluntly. I think it's incredibly problematic uh, on some levels. I don't know if you would necessarily agree with that. But the other theme from that is that that's what they had to do. It was the post-war generation. And then I sort of want to draw a parallel to the times in which we live now where, you know, I'm not saying this is the same as a war in, in any way, but certainly a unifying, um, stressful experience that, yeah, that we're collectively going through. I wonder if people in 20 years' time will get, oh, that was the post-COVID generation. That's why they did these things. So the um, stiff upper lip, the thing I think very strongly about that is that we need to be in touch with ourselves and be aware of what's going on in us. And those that are mentally thrive and do well find a way of expressing it. So they do find a way of talking about their feelings. The thing that I think really matters is that you choose who you speak them to so that you talk to people who you trust, who will listen to you, will respect what you're saying. And I don't really believe in sort of promiscuous honesty, like pouring out your feelings to anybody, anywhere, on social media, all over the place, because I think that feeds the whole, to make the whole bigger, rather than the kind of trust and connection and value that you get of being properly listened to and attended to. Now that has got my ears pricking up. Okay, so <laughs> let's just unpick, uh, un unpick that a little bit. So we need to, what what, we, what you're talking about really is vulnerability uh, and who can you be vulnerable with? And you're saying- And let's, honest. And honest. And like I said, you're saying let's be, let's be picky and choosy with that. Let's open up in the right place. Okay, so you're saying you don't necessarily think it's helpful to people to do that all the time everywhere. So if somebody is, let's say, doing that on social media, they feel, okay, this is a platform where I can connect and communicate with a lot of different people. So maybe I will share my innermost thoughts and, dis and, and sort of feelings on my social media grid. Would you say that there is some, you know, some unpicked emotions there that means that they they feel that they want to and have to do that on such a, a such a large platform potentially. And the reason I'm asking, it's I'm not. Uh, what's interesting for me is that I've noticed over the last year or so on this podcast, I'm opening up a lot more. Not with everyone, with the guests. I've, I guess the guests who are authentic with me, I respond back to them. And I feel that can be incredibly powerful, but I, I'd love to. I'd love you to help me unpick when is it appropriate in your in, in your eyes, and when is it not? I don't think I have all the answers. So I think we learn a lot about ourselves from other people. You know, Brené Brown, the power of vulnerability. I mean, yeah. she is my hero, and that we definitely need to do that. And that you doing it in conversation with someone that you kind of respect and trust that is going to be listened to by hundreds of thousands of people is very different so to just splurging without really consciously thinking about it, that you're going through a crisis and you kind of pour it out on social media. And I think one of the things I've been thinking about a lot that I wrote quite a bit about in the book is about identity. Yeah. And for identity, we have two, for 21st century, slightly conflicting evolutionary needs. We need to be unique and stand out in order to attract attention and, and from a biologically sort of evolutionary perspective to get a mate. And we also need to connect and to belong, to be part of a tribe. Yeah. And social media is the place where people often go out to stand out and be unique and some people create platforms that are very safe because they have followers that really 
align with who they are as a person so that it becomes a very safe place. I should think your platform is like that. My platform is like that. I don't tend to get lots of critical comments because people who are drawn to it are kind of like-minded. So when I say something personal about myself, it is because I want to say something that I think is of value and it connects with them. What I think is the kind of Wild West is when it's not done when you when you throw your most vulnerable self out there into a medium where you don't know what the reaction is going to be and that you can get really hurt and then you can keep feeding it wanting to get back what you lost in the first time and then you get into that negative cycle and i also think it's very different for an old bag like me doing it to a young person who doesn't fully know themselves who isn't necessarily protected yeah um and I'm sort of going on a bit, but the other thing I think about with feelings and emotion and mental health is I would like to draw a, not a line because it isn't so straightforward as that, but there is a difference between feeling sad, angry, furious, being in pain and having a diagnosable medical condition of, you know, bipolar, anxiety disorder, all the kind of disorders. And I yeah. think often people now pathologize what is an ordinary human, necessary, vital information giving feeling and make it an objective diagnosis that they need some fix for. Yeah. And I know that's an extension of what you were saying, but I think it's the same thing. But it, 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 it's, I, I love, I love what you said there. Uh, and I think it's a, it's really, it's, it's a really helpful way of looking at it. And I guess it goes back to... Can I interrupt you? You can, of course. And it's exactly what you didn't do when your first patient, when you were 22 or 23, walked into the room. So she came in saying, I'm depressed. I think I have depression. And you didn't go straight for that. You listened to her. And then she found out for herself what was actually beneath that diagnosis that she'd given herself. And then she found a lot of probably uncomfortable feelings that she found a way of expressing. And then in some ways by expressing them, she was released from them. She learned things. She maybe had to make changes. And that is the difference. Yeah, yeah. If that makes sense. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, You mentioned, you know, you mentioned the evolutionary sort of challenge, the conflict between the need to stand out, but also the need to belong. I found that super fascinating because the, the, the new book is about change, right? I was thinking about this on a walk this morning. I thought, okay, Julia's coming today. Let and me, you went you know, for a walk, you'll say, to follow your own rules. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I went for a walk to help me sort of process my thoughts a little bit. But this sort of evolutionary conflict, and it made me think about change. And I thought, okay, humans, we love security. We love stability. We love certainty. Yet, you beautifully make the case that change is like that is probably one of the only certainties in life is that things are going to change and that we're going to die and that we're going to die which is there's a you know which we can um you know for me that the your first book being on grief your second book on change actually they're natural extensions of each other because for many people like me my journey to change really started with my dad dying Mm -hmm. so grief was what really, really sort of forced me to stop. Okay, wait a minute. Let me look at my life a little bit. Let me look at what I'm doing. Is it where I want it to be? Whose life am I really leading here? So actually, I think there's a beautiful through line through these books. Um, but how, how do you how do you sort of explain that conflict between where we crave security and stability, yet change is a certainty? So of course, we're not going to be good at embracing change, right? I, I mean, I I think that's a really interesting way of saying it too. I like the way you've kind of made sense of it for yourself about change. And we like certainty and also we get excited, we get bored. Yeah. So we kind of put our head above the parapet. And in a way, the the... the the space that I call that is the fertile void. So when your dad died, you were suffering. So pain was your agent of change, wasn't it? You had to 
allow yourself to feel the pain, to face this new reality that you didn't want to be true, that your dad had died. But also it freed you then to look at who am I really? Am I living the life? Maybe, I don't know, I'm making this up that you wanted, he wanted you to live. Is this a space now where I can kind of choose for myself what what I believe and who I am and how I'm going to go forward? Because change is that nodal point. But there is a process of change, which is longer than anybody kind of wants or wishes, because change takes time and we need to give it time. So when you talk about safety and change, you know, change, we choose change as well. Change that we don't like is change that's imposed on us. So we choose change like getting married. We choose change like having a child. We choose change like moving house or having a job, getting divorced. Those, I mean, no one chooses divorce, but I mean, in some ways you do choose it, don't you? It's a decision in the end. But where am I going? Even the changes that you want are uncomfortable because it forces you to adapt to this new version of yourself in this new way of living. So, and I think what I'm saying in my book is the more we accommodate that discomfort and allow it and give it space and support ourselves through it, then the change happens and we adapt and thrive and grow. And that when we block it, we um, get a limited, more and more limited life. And you know those people who you kind of, if you tap them, you kind of feel that they're brittle and they have very fixed views, very fixed way of being that this is right and that's wrong and this is who I am. Whereas the people you feel like you want to connect to and engage with are people who are kind of more open, more open to what they feel, more open to uncertainty, more open to what you're saying and to flexibility. I think flexibility and adaptability are real life skill that we need to give ourselves permission to have rather than think that control, I think there's a false belief about control, that control means that we're safe. Yeah. And it doesn't. It can do, but it doesn't always, as the pandemic has shown. You said it's a process to change. And as you were explaining that, I was thinking, at what point are we okay with change? Isn't when we've got acceptance? Like, is, is accepting that life is going to change one of the most important skills? Or is acceptance part of the process of change? Is it like step three, step four, or step five? I don't know. I think, where, where does acceptance come in? Can you accept something right at the start? Or do you only get to acceptance having worked through change? It's a really good question. I think I I wonder about acceptance. Do we ever accept things that we really don't want to happen? Um, you know, like grieving. So I think it's more accommodation that you can't fight it. So accommodation, it's, it's, yeah. it's kind of letting yourself know that you this isn't a fight that you're going to win, that you can't will your way out of this. Yeah. You can't busyness your way out of this. You can't distract your way out of this. So the acceptance is the permission to kind of go with what happens within you and that that will influence the choices and the behavior that you then take. Um, I think the final step of a kind of meaningful transition is when it you kind of don't think about it anymore. Yeah. It's like you find yourself, you know, just doing it. So when you first did the podcast, it was like, oh, you know, there's a mic and I, I'm going to be this type of person. And through the process of learning, through the experience, through making mistakes, by looking at your mistakes, by feeling cross, by being frustrated, by feeling proud, by having success, you adapt and change. And now you just wake up and I'm doing a podcast and it's the most ordinary thing in the world. Yeah. So that's a simple way of change. And But it's true, I think, in every aspect of our life. It doesn't mean that we don't carry the wounds of that change with us. I mean, I think all of us, carry a kind of backpack of complex complex changes that have been imposed on us or memories or experiences of enforced change that will, of course, influence our attitude and behavior to the next change that happens. So a new loss will always bring back a previous loss. So in lockdown, people have felt 
um, higher levels of anxiety than they may normally have done because of the pandemic, but also it will have put them in touch with earlier experiences. So people who've had traumatic experiences are likely to have more mental problems now yeah. and difficulty and complexity because that will have in, ignited that, even if they've done all the EMDR and the processing, because your body remembers, your body holds the score. So it's not like you can put it to bed and it's a clean, tidy cupboard. You know, people often want to kind of Marie Kondo their feelings, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> kind of have my blues and my pinks and chuck out the rubbish and I'm never going to look at that again. Yeah. And we're human beings. Yeah. So we... The shadows of the stuff that's happened to us stay with us and sometimes they come and hit us in the face when we least expect it. I, uh, and it doesn't mean we haven't done it or we're not doing it right or that we've done it wrong. It's just that we're wired to for bias, for danger. And that's just that one coming back to yeah. tell you you're here again. It's like, oh. I mean, that is the, the cold, harsh truth, isn't it? You, you think you've processed something, you think you've moved on. Yeah, I'm... I'm I am good with that now. You know, I've, I've sort of left that behind. So then, boom, a new life situation. And it's it's like, ah, you know, it's a little reminder there, isn't there? But you never step in the same river twice. So cha you're changing yeah. all the time. So you, a lot of people have this kind of trajectory of life. And I talk about this quite a lot in the book about, you know, you, have, you start at the beginning and you go up this hill, you know, and you, you have this image of your life where you get there and you've arrived. And I think, Social media and lots of aspects of life kind of say that, you know, the five ways you're going to live your best life and the five ways that you're going to have, you're going to kick ass in your business, <laughs> all those things <laughs> that once you've got the five things, then you're sorted. And yeah. then I'm like winning and winning at life, all the kind of black and white pictures of life. In my mind, I mean, if someone can show me that it really is true, then I will be willing to listen. But life tends to be a kind of moving up and down process. And you have moments of enormous joy and, enorm and moments of absolute despair. And the skill, if you like, in the, the thing that makes a difference between someone who survives and thrives is the love and connection to others and their ability to move with it and go with it. You know, that idea of closure like you're talking about, you know, that I'm, that's done, it isn't a thing. It no. doesn't exist. It does if you're, if it's a, a, you know, building a house, you can finish building a house or a recording studio. Um, that is a finished product. Human beings are ever changing processes. Yeah feelings that you know that's what makes us human rights but at the same time it, it leads to the roller coaster of being a human being but but, but I, I really think that there is a societal pressure i think that and maybe maybe it's reflective of culture now that everything's sort of sound bitey and moving and it's fast and the way that you are it's like that image like i'm gonna be in the driving seat of yeah. my life and you do want to be in the driving seat of your life but don't think it's a Ferrari that doesn't need a mechanic. You know, where, you know, biologically, as a, as a doctor, we need MOTs. Don't, yeah. can't, you know, we need stuff to support us, to help us keep going. It doesn't just it, it's, happen. It's interesting that a thought I, I hadn't really had until we're having this conversation is when you think about change, change can mean so many different things, right? So, the nervous system, our stress response system, it thrives on change because actually it's when something is different, when, when it's uh, at, a, at a heightened level, so a stressor, that's when our bodies respond and go, oh, now I need to be able to effectively deal with this level of stress. So if given an appropriate time to sort of reset and rest and recuperate, it grows back stronger to better deal with that. You know, people get that in terms of a muscle. You know, I work my bicep in the gym and then I don't go for two days. I come back and my bicep is a bit bigger and a bit stronger. We get that with like the physical realm of our health. But I don't think we we quite think about it in the same way with other aspects of our health. So, so change is actually wired into you know, well, evolution, we, as human beings, we are wired to change. I mean, we wouldn't yeah. be who we are unless we were adaptive, right? Yeah, and I, and I sort of think as a, I know you're a, a grandmother, yes. um, which is, you know, fantastic. What's it like being a grandma? 
It's completely wonderful. Is it's it? like the gifts of having children without the load of looking after them all the time. Wow. It's the most, I think it's the biggest gift your children can give you. Yeah. Is their children. I'm, re- I'm reading a, um, a Daniel Lieberman book at the moment. It's just come out. I think it's called Exercised. And I'm Ex- ju- all sized. No, exercise. Okay. <laughs> I think that's in exercise. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's about movements. Okay. There's this bit on grandmas and actually um, the pleasure of being a grandmother, but also ha- what's wired into us as humans and that grand- grandmothers were also used to be very, very active. Um, they would be out, I think, in some of his research is showing that they'd be out sort of you know, gathering food and walking maybe for six hours a day to take the load off the daughter who might be uh, tending to the young children. It was just really, it's a really interesting idea. I thought, wow, you know, how far removed have we become from our evolutionary heritage? So, I, I, you know, you, you should read it. It's, it's, it's super really interesting. interesting. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, family systems, I think is incredibly interesting. I talk about that a bit in the book about transgenerational family beliefs, values, systems, trauma, behaviors, responses. So in my case, I worked actively not to replicate the patterns I saw in my parents because I I wanted it to be, I wanted to be different. And I had the opportunity because the therapy was around in a way it wasn't for them. But I could easily have just repeated it. And what people talk about you know, generational trauma and and the positives, um, but in particular trauma is until the generation is prepared to feel the pain, the transmission of the trauma carries on down. Um, and I think that's incredibly interesting for so many families now. Um, so the trauma gets passed down sort of through the genes. Epigenetically and behaviorally. Yeah, and, and then sort of a lot of spiritual teachers uh, talking about this being the generation where we now go and actually heal our ancestral trauma, yes. you know, which I find super interesting. It is, and um, important. I don't, I mean, it's a, I think that's a really important new understanding. Yeah, that we, that we, you know, it's interesting. I know on the way up, you were listening to my chat with Gabor Mate, and I think on my first conversation with him, um, or maybe maybe when I've heard him speak live before, he he's spoken about that. I think when he was, I think he was born in Poland. Um, I could be wrong on that, but, but he was born in Eastern Europe. Maybe it's Hungary, actually. I can't remember. But wherever wherever Gabel was born, I think he said at the time there was it was all kinds of pressures and and stress stresses. The Nazis were occupying where, where he was born, and. He's 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 spoken about the the trauma he feels he absorbed from his mum at that time, which in many ways has played out in his life, and he's sort of totally influenced what he does and who he is now. Absolutely, and in many ways, you think, well, he's a, he's someone who's helping hundreds of thousands of millions of people around the world, and I guess in some ways he possibly wouldn't be doing that without the trauma that he experienced. And it's, you know, that's fascinating in itself. Like, was the, is, is that trauma? Yes, it's affected him, but he's managed to use it to now help so many other people. But I think transgenerational trauma, I think is something that people often aren't thinking about. And so do you, you know, I wonder if you could share some, some of your thoughts on that for people listening. Well, first about the transgenerational trauma and Gabor Mate is that there's a lot of research, and I know you've talked about it on other podcasts, about post-traumatic growth. And it's not about transforming the suffering into a positive, like you can kind of flick a switch and and you make it better. But what it talks about is that you need to acknowledge the level of the loss and the suffering and allow, give it its place in you, that it influences you and shapes you and your body remembers it. It's part of you and it will always be part of you. And it also is a kind of intense change because it's trauma is a kind of wound that is cuts through everything through you that can change your whole view of yourself and the world and your perspective about what matters about yourself and the world. Yeah. And often people who survived, say, the, the, the Martianess disaster, say that that, 
that how they viewed the world felt like growth after a member of that, you know, a partner had died in the Marchioness disaster because what they recognized was that um, love and connection is what matters most at the end of the day. And it meant that their whole perspective of who they were and how they lived their lives um, was reshaped in a way that felt much more meaningful and where they felt they belonged. Yeah. And Gabor Maté has done that with Nobson, hasn't he? Yeah. But your was your question... Um, about transgenerational trauma is, I think one of the interesting ways to look at it for people who are listening is that you can buy these books on um, to do a family tree, genograms. Yeah. And so you fill in the, as many of the people who they were and you can fill in what you know about them. And through that, you can see patterns of behavior of divorce, of addiction, of suicide. And, you know, what people talk about often, it's the secrets that kill us. Yeah. You may, if you talk, you know, I really recommend young people, people my age to talk to people in their family from a different generation and learn the stories and the secrets that haven't been told yeah. because that will release them and free them to understand so much of why, say, their parent behaved a particular way and how that has influenced them. And once you have a, a real of understanding of where you've come from, it gives you the roots and the strength to kind of know better where you want yeah. to go. And there's research that shows that people who have all the stories from their past, they know where their grandparents were born, they know all that yeah. content have much more higher self-esteem and confidence. That That is so fascinating because it, it, of course it makes sense once you understand exactly where you've come from, it, it just, it probably helps just fill in those blanks. It helps you ground and understand who you are, where you fit in. in, Has that, in I mean, with you, do you know the story? I don't know the stories of your parents. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that, Julie, because... I think I'm, I'm like, so dad died seven years ago. Dad's life, you know, very much, you know, Indian immigrants uh, comes over in 1962 to the UK when UK are from, from India, when they're actively recruiting doctors from overseas to come and help fill the gaps here. And so dad comes over with nothing and, you know, works his way up, puts up with all kinds of racism and prejudice, but, but uh, comes here with the desire to build a better life for him and his family. So working hard for us sending money home for his family, frankly, working like crazy for those years, which I'm, I'm convinced killed him and, and caused oh. him to get lupus at 57. Um, but what's interesting is that I didn't really see dad was, you know, when he was around, you know, it was great, but I didn't even see dad much growing up. He was working, he was a full time consultant at Manchester Royal Infirmary. He worked four nights a week as well for an on-call service. So dad only slept three nights a week for 30 years. Oh my God. Yeah, I, I mean... What I, does that do to your what immune does that do system? To you? Exactly. And then there's, no one will convince me that that wasn't a huge fat fact sense of why he got lupus. Um, and that then, you know, His really... His whole system has whole been system. But, but But dad getting ill and why it's, I guess, a little bit, in some ways still feels raw, is that... It changed 15 years of our family life completely changed. I mean, that transfer, okay, I've not thought about it in this context. That was change, right? That was seismic change. That was seismic change, but it's so interesting. I knew I was chatting to you. I know I'm thinking about change. I was thinking about all things in my life, but I didn't think of that. That was, you know, it's like things sit there right in front of your nose, but you don't see it until the obvious is obviously pointed out to you. But you and know. grief starts at the point of diagnosis. So the moment your dad had the diagnosis of lupus, your whole family grieved the dad that you had and had to adjust and change to this new dad who had this yeah. life-changing diagnosis and what that did to all of you. So all of you, it's what I'd call a living loss, but it's grief. It has all the uh, experiences of grief, emotions of grief. So I felt a tingle as you said that because I have never thought about it like that before. For me, um, for me, I perceived the grief 
as the day dad died. And I was going to explore with you something I've heard you say before, which is the relationship continues even though the person has died. And we'll come to that. But I, I just wanted to just expand on what you said there. That's really interesting because at that time in my life, I had left home two years previously to go to Edinburgh to be a medical student. So, you know, you're away, 250 miles away from home with all the freedom that you could possibly dream of or once you're away, you know, there's all kinds of temptations and all sorts of things, you know, so you're there living your life, you know, I don't think dad had ever been ill before. And then suddenly like two and a half years in where I was doing my immunology degree, you know, dad got ill. And no one quite knew what it was for three months. He was in hospital. Loads of different specialists came around to try and, you know, why has he got this fever? No one could figure it out. And then one night uh, I got a call. I was in Edinburgh, maybe about half 10. And, uh, you know, I've not thought about this for years, actually. But the, the call was from my mum, who was in intensive care, saying, look, you, you need to come home now. Um, yeah. Dad's like, they're not sure he's going to make the night, make, make it through the night. And I was uh, like, it was... But even thinking about it now, it was like it didn't feel real. And my 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 buddy Steve, who I lived with at the time, just so, you know, just put me in his car and he drove me back four wow. hours back to the hospital. But that was the start of that. I, I don't actually remember life before my dad got ill because it defined my whole adult life. I literally, it's the reason I ended up leaving Edinburgh and moving back to the Northwest. It's why I live here now. Uh, because I'm five minutes away from where mum is. I came back to help look after my dad, which I did for 15 years. Wow. And I think I really struggle with his death because, well, I say because everyone's got their own experience with grief. And my experience was that I would see my dad every day, two to three times a day, seven wow. days a week. I would, you know, towards the end, I would shave him, shower him, you know, all sorts of... So, so suddenly when that... It was your job. As it was my job, as well as trying to be a, 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 a caring husband yeah. and a GP. And so there was just this massive hole in my life when my dad died and it, and and purpose and meaning yeah everything, everything. like so, and your love of your dad but it since was, i was 20 till he something like 35 i don't remember my phone ever going off like i don't remember ever switching off i was always on alert on alert when's the phone going to ring oh is mom going to phone is he all right? dad's fallen can you come around and pick him up so it, it's it's right. really interesting now to have 7 years where I feel now my shoulders drop and I can actually live my life, right? But you asked the question, didn't you, right at the start? You said, what is um, what, what is your story? So, so what is the story of your parents and, and their upbringing? And I think it was, it was funny. It was only when dad got ill in the last two, three years of dad's life when he really couldn't do much, I got to learn more about him. I got to learn stuff. I got to hear stories. And now, man, I wish he was here. There's so much I you want wish to... You recorded it. Yeah. You know, I, I, I wish that I could ask him more, particularly now as I progress as a father and as my kids get older, I think, oh, dad, you know, when, you know, when I was 10, like my son is now, what was it, you know, what were you thinking? You know, you know those little things I'd love to be able to, but I am, I've learned from that and I'm actually doing that with my mum. I was going to say, you must do it with your mum. Yeah, so it's really interesting that I'm now learning a lot. Like, it's funny, as, as, as my the last Are years... Are you taping it? I'm not. Tape it. You know what? I, I, it's really interesting. As you learn more about your parents, you learn more about yourself. Of course. You, right? Of and, course. So... And now you must learn about your grandparents too. Yeah. Well... Did, you know, do you, what do you get... were their beliefs? What did they, th you know, all those questions like, what did your grandparents believe about religion, about sex, about money, about work, about family, about love, about duty, about all of the things that influence us? It's really worth knowing as far back as you can. And what, did their behavior match what they believe? What are the thing? What are the secrets? Obviously, I said. Now, what if you can't? So. Have you had any clients who were orphans or um, who were adopted? And do you see a common theme playing out in some of these clients because they don't have those stories? Yes, I have. And the work that we do is to grieve the loss of what they wish they knew. 
that they, you know, they get to a limit. So particularly, say, with adopted parents, they may not be able to get more information or the ado- the adopting parent won't want to see them or refuses to see them. So there's a sort of double rejection. And then that's a lot of work about grieving what you don't know and what you can never find out and all the what-ifs and the kind of dreams that you imagined and what you wished for. And you have to face that that's at an end, that you have to stop dreaming. Because a lot of people don't stop dreaming and hoping and and then kind of stay stuck in this in a sort of limbo. Yeah. And so you have to do the work. W- would you say... All of it's work, isn't it? It is work. work. It is psychological work. I, I, I think when you get into this work, I, I genuinely feel it's the most rewarding work there is because you're discovering who you are, like who you really are. Like, as you said before, your identity, not... Which is multiple. Which is... So many different identities that we all have. Well, that's interesting. So a lot of us are looking for the identity that is truly authentic ours. Are you sort of suggesting that that is a, a false ambition because actually that doesn't exist? I see myself as multiple identities, and that I shift and change um, kind of what's important depending which identity I'm kind of most in at the time. So there are fixed identities. So I'm, you know, I'm white. Um, I was brought up as C of E. And those, I mean, I can change my religion, but there are sort of fixed identities that you're born with yeah. that are genetic. Most other de- identities, and particularly in the 21st century, are more fluid than they've ever been on a kind of gender um, uh, perspective, um, how you have relationships perspective. There are so many choices and ways that we can kind of go on that on that spectrum. But for me, I have a work identity. I have a parent identity, a grandparent identity, yeah. a partner identity. I have... Um, so it, with me, it's like relationships and my belief system, identity, um, my family identity, my yeah. family I was born into. So there, there are multi, multiple identities. And I think for a sense of well-being, it works when those identities kind of sit comfortably together. So say I was a young man who came from a family who thought homosexuality was um, wrong. But being a part of a family is very important, like belonging in the family, respecting the family, seeing the family. So then there's a a clash between who you find yourself to be from a sexual identity and the family that is a very important one. And so that takes a lot of working out. But if you don't recognize all those different identities, then you just get stuck. You don't know, you know something's really wrong, but you can't always work out what it is. And then going back to what you said earlier, which really sparked, uh, really got my attention, which is you're effectively saying that you can't escape your feelings. Like you can pretend that you're not, you know, you can pretend they're not happening, but they will manifest in some way. They will... They'll get lodged in your body. They will cause you to have a row with your partner or snap at your kids. You can't, you can't escape them. They're going to be there. So, uh, you know, I, and, and I think that is such a key take home for all of us, right? And also to remember that you can't put logic through an emotional system so that people say, you know, I'm so, people have what I call their shitty committee. I'm an idiot. I shouldn't be feeling like this. It's ridiculous. I'm making too much fuss, you know, or, and it could be against somebody else. The same kind of tirade of fury. But 80% of our decision making comes from our feelings and our previous experience and what we've learned. So to think that your kind of cognitive brain is logically kind of in that Descartian way, kind of informing you and telling you what to do and its logic is just not true. So that, it, and in, I think particularly in relationships and relationship to ourselves, which is our, one of our key relationships, but that influences the most important thing is, which is our relationship with other people. You cannot put logic through it. Yeah. That, that is, that is well worth it. 
people sitting with, myself included, you can't always logic it. Do you, I mean, do you think men and women process this stuff differently in your experience? Of course, that's a gross generalization, but is by and large, are there, are there sort of some different ways in which they tend to respond to these things? I mean, in my experience, yes, with the clients and couples that I work with, I see real tendencies. What, what are those tendencies? So, I mean, with loss, for instance, which is the one I most commonly work with, which could be living losses or, or loss from, from death, is women tend to be loss-oriented. So women tend to want to emote. Women tend to have a Sherlock Holmes kind of desperate to know exactly what happened, to unpick every piece of the story, every piece of the jigsaw, to want to remember, to have memory box, to talk about it, to go over it. Men tend to be restoration-oriented. They tend to want to get on, to move forward, to keep going, to survive. And often men kind of, with me, they rub their legs like they want to run. You know, it's like they physically... And I think there is a an evolutionary aspect of it, of, you know, women staying home. And I mean, I'm not talking about the 21st century women, but from our evolutionary yeah. drives. And so what I when I work with couples... I talk about they can help each other do the other so yeah. that she can help him do some of the loss work and find a way of talking about how he feels and he can help her do some of the restorative work it's like having hope for a future looking what they're going to do next having a break from the grief watching Netflix and often the way to do that best is walking and talking so the you know as couples I think walking and talking is your best therapy there's a synchronicity yeah and it's the flow. So we've talked about what we talk about, what we've talked about a lot is how you can't fight your feelings and that when you let them, when you focus on them and that you let them inform you about what's going on, you find words for it. So you find a way to describe it. And then that gives you information and then you kind of release because you're not so stuck with them. If you're doing that in movement, that is, aligned with the person that you care about most that is in nature is a kind of added benefit not on a busy high street you kind of look at the floor you can have space or the ground rather you have space and movement that you but you're, you're not eyeballing each other so like how are you feeling you know i mean if i ask my husband how are you feeling it just you know just will not answer it's probably thinking is this is this like a therapy how, how am I feeling or is <laughs> so, this you know, like, but I think <laughs> it is one of the most annoying questions of all time because you know that the minute someone says to me how you're feeling they're basically saying you're in a bad mood or what's wrong <laughs> why are you well you know why are you being out of sorts why are you being a pain in the neck is basically what people are saying I mean not always I know but yeah um whereas if you so in our family with my kids, my adult kids and my husband, always when there's a problem, we go for a walk. So when someone says to me, can we go for a walk? Sometimes I slightly dread it <laughs> because there's something that they need to talk to me about that is about me doing something that is really upset them, which I don't want to hear. But it is the best way to do it. But uh, not only is it great to, to share that as a really practical tool for people, <laughs> yes. it's free. Right, it's free. Right, so for people listening, I guess if all they take from everything we discussed so far, if you're having problems or you have something you want to get off your chest, go for a walk with someone whilst you do it. Well, I think that's a pretty pretty good takeaway. And then give yourself a treat afterwards. Like in the past, it would be go to a pizza or go to the pub or yeah. go and have a cup of tea, so that you do the walk and talk, and then you do something that is kind of restore. It feels like a treat. Yeah. And then and don't. Don't pick it up again. You know, kind of let it be. Like you've had the walk and talk, have your cup of tea or your, your meal or pint or whatever it is, and then go home and have an, a bit of peace. I, I like that one about don't pick it up again, right? I think, I think that's worth reiterating. So you go for a walk, you, without eye contact, you process whatever you want to process. you can have eye contact, but, you know, basically you're... yeah. And you can have hugs and that whole It's not all or... like eye to eye sort of with the intensity. Why is it so important that once you finish, you A, sort of, it sounds like you ritualize it in some way where there's something like a cup of tea at the end. And why not pick it up after? The boundary of that this has a, a kind of 
uh, a life of its own that's protected. Yeah. That is sort of in some ways sacrosanct between the two of you, if it's a couple or you and your child, that this is the place and the way that you talk about difficult things. And then you hold the boundary of it. You keep that space as a safe place that is where you do that. And then you step out of it and you have normal interaction and give yourselves a treat and kind of celebrate it. I I really like that, Julia. I, I, I really, really like it. I think... You know, I, I always love when when we can simplify things to help people. And I think there's a beautiful simplicity there about going for a walk with someone else, have a ritual at the end, which closes it off, and then don't go and revisit that. There's like sort of three steps to that that I'm hearing. But I think it's very hard for many of us to apply all three. I think certainly for me, I suspect the tendency would be after the cup of tea, so go, oh yeah, you know, we, we didn't quite finish. Uh, Journal it. Exactly. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna move on. What but for people who who feel the need, you would say, write it down. And, and why is that and helpful? Log it. Well, like writing it down. I mean, journaling is is shown to be as as effective as as talking treatments, because when you put it down, it beca- it from being um, invisible and kind yeah. of stuck in you. It's something that you can see and it's on the page and you, you release it by doing that. But also when you go for another walk and talk, it's there. Yeah. I, I, I'm a massive, massive fan of journaling, both for my patients, but also for me personally. Uh, and again, I, I just think it is such, like like it's many... Free. Yeah. Like <laughs> it takes many, five minutes. Yeah. I mean, like many of the best tools that are out there, and I, and I, and I, I know I say this quite a bit, but I, I really feel strongly about this, that there is this perception that well-being and wellness is the preserve of a certain class and a certain income level. And I'm not at all um, pretending that there aren't socioeconomic determinants of health. I, I absolutely recognize that. But I'm very passionate also that having worked in a lot of areas which would be considered deprived, these tools, walking, uh, journaling, they actually are exercise. Uh, exercise they, they are accessible. They are very cheap, if not completely free. And, and you know, I, I would get, I, I, I'm sure you would agree with this, but I would challenge anyone who struggles with uh, feelings or thoughts, if they just for w- one week, for five minutes a day, write down those thoughts on a piece of paper, just watch what happens and observe. Um, would, would you sort of concur? I completely agree. And what I haven't told you is that I had a suicidal client um, about eight months ago who came to me, I mean, in a very, very bad way. And I gave her your book and I gave her the five things, three, five minute things to do because she was, she could barely function. She really wanted to be dead. And she told me how she was going to kill herself. But those, the connection, the um, movement and um, what's the third one? It's mind, body and heart. So heart is connection, uh, body is some sort of movement and mind is some form of uh, mental health practice, so journaling breathing, or breathing, yeah. yeah. She did those, and I really think it contributed to saving her life. Yeah, I mean, I mean, thank you for sharing. Um, it, it is lovely to hear that. And well, so what I'm saying, why I said it is because that was five minutes, like you talk about. Yeah, it isn't. And that was for a massive, complex, difficult, suicidal problem. And yet, it worked. And, and I've, I've often said about the ideas in Field Better in Five that there is a deceptive simplicity to them. I think it's very easy to think, oh, what, what could five minutes do? But um, yeah, I mean... It, it, I'm really, I'm pleased that it was a value um, for, for that. someone. You save one life, you save the world, right? Yeah. I mean, it's certainly the way I think we both like to look at things, you know, how you do one thing is how you do everything. Um, but but sort of to reiterate to people, if you're struggling, try it. You know, it, it can make a difference. Um, Big time. What, what other sort of 
routines and rituals do you recommend for people? I think something that is unrecognized is altruism, is being kind to others, helps our immune system. And again, it doesn't have to be in a, a huge way. So, I mean, the sort of, in my book, I have eight pillars of yeah. strength, which you would say is way too complicated. In some ways, it is very complicated. <laughs> Not at all. I, I love that, actually. I was I was reading about an hour before you got here, that section at the back. It's really great, actually. Okay, really good. Um, but what I sort of talk about then is that through the process of change, you need to establish ways of being, habits, and attitudes to yourself that support you and that pillars like in your book for the four pillars pillars are like a kind of structure that holds you together when you feel like you're breaking apart and that you have to consciously choose to do them so one of the pillars is your relationship with yourself like being self-compassionate and being aware of that shitty committee that attacks you and the other one is relationship to others and often when we're in the process of change we show others, we go to our default mode of coping, which can be to be angry. I mean, I think it's really bad wiring of nature that when we suffer and when we're in pain, we become the version of ourselves that we don't like and nobody else likes. You know, because you're tricky, you're short-tempered, you are jealous, you feel furious, you're thin-skinned, everything upsets you for good reason, but it means you don't get the compassion, the love, the connection, that if you're happy, everyone wants to see you, yeah. they love you. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and so one of the, talking about habits to answer your question, sorry, I, went, I kind of went off. We need to kind of, being aware of that we're feeling difficult, we're angry, we wake up in a really bad mood, we want to hit out on people, hit out at people, not on people. You may actually want to hit on people too because people use sex as a way of feeling better. Uh, but anyhow, whatever is going on, but it's sort of discombobulated. It's in turmoil. You don't like yourself. You're dreading the day that you're having. The kind of the first piece is to kind of acknowledge that that is normal given that you're going through a very difficult time yeah like when you're going through a difficult time i am not going to be this best version of myself i'm not going to be the version that i'm proud of and that people move towards so kind of acknowledge it and give yourself that self-compassion yeah and then kind of think about what well, actually given that i'm really kind of distressed and upset what is going to work for me and I you know very much like you the thing the first thing I tell all clients to do is to take exercise like get your heart rate going it reduces the cortisol levels it raises the oxytocin levels it stops you feeling so anxious and you have then a clearer mind to kind of face your day yeah. and it can be five minutes it can be 10 minutes whatever it is just get your heart rate up. I always think it's better to go outside, but if you don't want to go outside. And then I, I, the sort of, the big thing is that, is to connect to people that, that you love and that care about you. And, you know, love is strong medicine, as I've said, but also love is not a soft skill. Love is tough. It's tough to live. It's love. It's tough to do. And when you're suffering, you often hate the people you're closest to. And they often hate you. I mean, hate is a simplistic word, but they're often the hardest people to be close to. Yeah. I mean, so much to think about there. You know, I'm conscious we've been chatting for a while, but I, I, I sort of really wanted to ask you a couple of questions on grief. Um, and this is partially because I know in my own network, but also as a doctor and seeing what's happened over the last few months, a lot of people are contending with grief at the moment, whether, you know, I've never really heard this phrase of a living loss, which you, which you sort of, uh, which you say, which really, I think it's very powerful to think about that as a, as a living loss. Um, you know, I think the lockdown, COVID for many people has literally, we're, we're mourning, aren't we, the lives that we used to lead. But for people who have lost people... Well, they've died. I don't really like the term lost. Okay. So, we, okay. Can you, maybe, could you expand on that? 
Well, we lose things every day. The thing about death is that it's permanent and irreversible. So I think we use metaphors sometimes to soften the kind of brutality or the difficulty of death. But when we actually name it as death, there's no misunderstanding. And I think that is helpful. Yeah, I, I love that. And I, I thank you very much for, for, for pointing that out because that touches on a theme that, that I really wanted to ask you about, which is what I just did there without thinking about it was a way to soften it, right? And if we have a friend or a colleague or someone we care about who who is going through grief, who is, who, um, I was going to say lost again, who someone close to them has died, often we feel uncomfortable ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what to say, so we sort of lighten it. And, and often I think we do it to make ourselves feel better. So I, I, I want, I'd love to, to hear some of your thoughts on that, but also I just want to throw in as well. And this is something I've been thinking a lot over the last few years is do we have an issue in this sort of the society in which I live, which is Western society in the UK. And secular. And secular. We don't really talk about death. And I think a lot of indigenous cultures Death is very much embraced as a part of life. There's ritual. It's not like I remember when my dad died, my son was only two and a half, maybe nearly three. I didn't know what to say. I was at a loss. I don't think I had a good vocabulary around death. I don't think we do in this Western society, frankly, at all. But I said, oh, you know, Dadu, which is what um, we call, certainly in Bengali culture in India, we call granddad's Dadu. I said, oh, Dadu's gone up to the sky. And I never really felt that comfortable with it because I thought like he would look up and go, oh, is Daddy there? And I'm thinking at the time that's, I did the best I could. But if I was going through that process now, I don't think I would say it in that way. And you're shaking you your heads. I would talk to you first. So, so I'm sorry to throw three or four themes at you there, but I think they're going to be themes that a lot of people are thinking about at the moment and potentially struggling with. So, I mean, it, they're very important themes. And um, so, first of all, I think we do have a taboo around death. I mean, I think it is changing that we have this kind of magical thinking that if I even talk about, say, the word dead or dying or think about death, it will somehow hasten my own death. And if somehow I kind of think it happens to other people, then it's out there and, and it's not going to disturb me. The kind of surprising benefit, if you like, I'm not, the benefit isn't the right word, the thing about COVID is that it's made us all much more aware of our mortality. And I think it's meant that we've had the kinds of conversations that I would encourage people to be having, to talk about death, to talk about what what they would want to happen to them if they died, to think about ethical wills, not just about what you're going to do with your stuff, but your the sort of beliefs that you're going to, you want people, your children or people that you care about. To, to think about it for themselves. And then if you're being close to or a family member or a friend of someone who is bereaved um, from COVID, for, I mean, there are so many things to say, but the first of all is to acknowledge it. So the person that is grieving, as you say, they are transmitting a lot of suffering and we pick that up bodily in our system and that it makes us want to run. It makes us want to get away mm -hmm. Or it makes us want to, as you say, very rightly, find a fix. And it, often it's a fix to make them feel better. But also I think it's trying to give us a sense of, like, I feel so powerless. What can I do? Death is happened and I can't make this better. And so people then say very unhelpful things like it's an end to his suffering or he's gone to a better place, which people who are grieving on the whole, not everybody, find incredibly difficult and annoying. So the, the big message is, is to is to make contact first of all don't kind of disappear and cross the street which people still do because they're frightened of saying something wrong saying something is better than nothing and really all you have to say is i'm so sorry that whoever it is has died and acknowledge it and say it genuinely yeah. and then you know in their network of their friends whether you're a close friend that needs to show up and turn up and bring lasagna sit with them make soup with them be with them or you're a kind of further 
distant friend where you can drop things off, where you can maybe help now and again, send texts and show up maybe later, you know, because the numbness and the shock is is for a long time. The greater the suddenness of the death, the greater the surrealness, the greater the emotional investment in the person that's died, the greater the, the shock lasts for. Does that yeah. does that make sense? Yeah. And so with with COVID, it's likely to be unexpected and out of the blue, very sudden. And also they weren't there to say goodbye. So ma- many of the deaths happened through a screen. So people, it feels surreal. It feels, you know, they didn't have an ending like we've always imagined an ending that you're sitting, I hope you were with or near your dad when he died. So you had the opportunity to say I, goodbye. I, I was with my dad holding his hand for the 12 hours leading up to his death, I literally can remember him having his last meal, which somehow after a week or so of not responding much, he per- everyone came to see him. It's like he perked up for his last meal. Oh. And, you know, my, my son was climbing on top of him in the, in the, in the hospital beds. Um, and, and, you know, everyone was there. And... I remember holding his hand and seeing, it was quite medicalized because he was connected to the machines and you could see his blood pressure dropping. And I was just, I was on one side, my mum was on the other side. And literally I was, I, I, I felt, I feel so lucky that I got to feel every bit of life inside of him just slowly drain until he was no longer alive. And if I think about that now in contrast, of course that's not... Um, such an important, significant, precious memory yeah. for m- very many reasons, which is living in you like alive right now, like it was yeah. seven years ago. It's like so alive in you. It's like a video, isn't it? Uh, yeah. And, and it's funny because I, I, th- I kind of have felt I've, I'm okay with everything now. And, and I think I am actually, but I mean, I don't know how do you... Wh- how do you know when you have grieved? Is there a moment, like, is it when you don't get tearful anymore? What, what is, or, or is it different for everyone? It, it isn't over because the love never dies. So that me- very significant memory of you with your dad is, is in your body and is alive in you. And it came up now as strongly and you would want it to. You wouldn't want it to be less. So what we talk about now is, that you you live the new normal so that you learn to accommodate and live with the reality that the person that you love has died. And you can go through, you know, a few years down the line, you can go through weeks or even months not thinking about them. And then you'll see their favorite meal or you'll smell it or you'll hear a piece of music. And the memory of them comes through you and it feels like they died yesterday. And you may feel incredibly sad, but people kind of embrace that because... You know, like it, I've often said, the love never dies. So right. it's by remembering and touchstones to memory that they live in, on in us. And so you could ask your dad a question now and you'd probably be able to find the answer. Yeah. But to contrast that yeah. with someone dying in a care home or an intensive care unit where the people significant to them, maybe they had to shield too and couldn't come in or couldn't become in because of the health policies, and watching it over a screen with a nurse is unbearable. So it's traumatic. Do, do we know yet? Have we got anything to compare this to? Like, do we do we know the impact of that for, for people who are grieving? So the single biggest predictor of outcomes in grief is the love and connection to others. So many the, the numbers of people that died were mainly older. Of course, there were younger ones. They were a vulnerable shielding community so that children couldn't necessarily, that adult children couldn't necessarily be with them. So there were very many older generation in their home together who'd been healthy and well, where one of them became ill. Sometimes both of them became ill. One maybe have survived yeah. without the support of their children um, or other family members watching their the person who they may have been married to for like 50 years die over a screen and then they don't have the normal rituals so they had a small socially distanced funeral which may be weeks away or somewhere on zoom 
you know, many people I've worked with have their their parents died on their funeral was on Zoom. So all the hundreds of years of practices and rituals and ways of behaving around death that support us, that enable Tens us. Tens of thousands of years, probably. Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, Avebury has these stones, you know, we put stones in the ground as a memory of tombstones for death that have been for millions of years. So we've developed rituals for millions of years of how to cope with the complexity of death and the um, way death is is irreversible and invisible. So it's so visible the person has died and yet everything that we feel about it, those words, you know, grief is a five-letter word, but what we feel is like five worlds inside us trying to come to terms with it and trying to find a way of living with it. Yeah. And so all our natural ways of supporting ourselves have been taken off the table at the same time. Yeah. So certainly in my lifetime, I mean, I think the First World War, which changed all the behaviours around death because up to then, you know, death was very much part of life. Queen Victoria was the sort of poster woman for grieving, wearing black, you know, all after um, Albert died till she died. But the First World War, where millions of people died, away from home and never came back. Yeah. That generation of mourners who they didn't have rituals, they had to get on, they had to survive. And my parents, who were the children of those generations, all those rituals and ways of behaving be kind of were shifted and changed. So that is likely, I mean, that's the only thing that I can yeah. think of that is similar. But I know that all the helplines have been, to begin with, they were very quiet. So March and April, very few people contacted them. And then f from the end of April, it's gone up five, ten times. For, for people who, who are listening or watching and are struggling, um, I mean, I, I would absolutely recommend both of your books, but your first one, Grief Works, I think would be incredibly uh, valuable for them. Are, are there any other places you'd point oh, them yeah, to? On my website is What Helps, and there's Cruise, Bereavement Care. There's all the organisations that they can get online support from. So, so what's your website? www.juliasamuel.co.uk Yeah, brilliant. And I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes as well so people can easily find that. It's in the What Helps section. Yeah. I mean, interesting you say about wearing black. And I, it made me think in that sort of comparison I was making to Indigenous cultures – there's this tradition to wear black here. Um, if I think to my grandparents and my grandma, she would wear what? a white sari um, after my granddad died. So that was that there are these symbols in culture, which in one way, I guess, is helpful. But then if we flip it, is any of that potentially problematic? Like, I, I don't want us to judge other people in terms of how, you know, everyone's got a right, I think, to to deal with death the way they want to deal with it. And, and different There's no right way. Yeah, exactly. But I wonder, some cultures sort of celebrate, don't they? Rather than mourn a death, they celebrate a death. I, th I mean, certainly in, in South America, there's a sort of big celebration and yeah. a festival around death and different belief system and color and music and dance. But isn't that fascinating how we're all is. humans, we've all, we're all sort of wired the same way, yet the, the kind of, the absolute certainty in life that none of us can avoid is that we are going to die. And although we're the same, the way we look at death and, and celebrate or mourn it is so different depending on where we live and how we were brought up. Completely. But I think the, <sighs> the thing between black and white or South America is the symbols make um, tangible what's invisible. So whatever they are, whether you're wearing yeah. a white sari or a black armband if you're a footballer or, um, or black armband anyway – to represent death, it signifies someone has died yes. and we can all read it. And I wish that we more wore black armbands all the time so that when you're on the tube or when you've left your credit card behind when you're mourning, that you even had a little black yeah. ribbon, you know, like a yellow or a pink one. So people would be kinder to you. They'd know like they wouldn't be screaming at you because you're 
you know, when you're grieving your memory and everything is chaotic, you know, yeah. people often forget their credit cards or forget half their shopping or forget where they are. And so it would be nice to have an external symbol so that people are a bit nicer to you. Yeah, that's that's such a lovely thought. And you think how many times do people get annoyed with other people? Parking in, or... Parking you know, or, or in traffic or they've sort of pulled out a junction or whatever, you know, and we're, we're, as a society, I think we're pretty quick to judge. We, yeah. don't, we don't really think, well, what could be going on in their lives? Yeah. Maybe they're not where they want to be. So yeah. that's a really nice idea. Um, we, we could probably easily have another conversation just on grief, Julia. Uh, one question I am going to ask before we finish, and it's just touches to what I said before, and this is slightly selfish because I, I would love to know the answer for myself, but also for people, um, is... If my dad had died now, I would call you and I would say, Julia, how should I describe this to my, to my son? son? And the reason I'm asking this is I say selfish. I, 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 I'm sort of, I, I don't really feel it's selfish. I actually feel this would be very valuable for a lot of people. Uh, have you got some sort of guidance for people on how they can explain death to children? I have. So the outcome that you want is the children have the same truth and understanding as all the adults around them. So when you try and protect them by using words like gone to heaven or gone to a better place, that is um, giving them a story. Heaven could be a hamburger joint down the road that doesn't tell them the reality of what's happened. But also they will have heart, they will know something isn't right. They'll see you crying, other people crying. They'll see everyone coming in and out of the house in the past. Um, and they'll know something's wrong, but they need to have a story, a beginning, a middle and the end that explains what is going on around them. And it needs to be the same story that you have. So what children don't know, they make up and what they make up is much more likely to be frightening than the truth. So the reality, however difficult it is, say it's, uh, it's death by suicide, which people often don't want to tell children, telling them that truth is better than them finding out from social media or their friends or knowing that you're not telling them the truth or finding out that you didn't tell them the truth 10 years later where they then don't trust the most significant person in their life. So the words that you use, and you can kind of think about this with your partner or someone close to you, is to be very simple. So first of all, say, what do they understand has happened to your grandfather? Is there anything that you understand? Check what their understanding is first. And they probably know, <laughs> you know, they'll probably say, but if they don't, you say that I'm really sad, but grandpa died this morning or a few hours ago. And his body looks like he's asleep, but he's not asleep. He has died. And that means that his body doesn't work anymore. Yeah. And then you allow them to ask you questions, to check. And one of the big things with children is they may then run off and go and kick a football. But And so you kind of need to let them. But when they come back, let them ask you the questions and always tell you the truth. And one of the big things with children is that we need children to be allowed to grieve like adults. So one of the metaphors for children is to let them jump in a puddle and be very sad and let them jump out of a puddle and be a happy child, not a bereaved grandchild. But often what we do as parents, we want to stop them suffering. So we say, no, 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 don't be sad about grandpa. He's better. He's yeah. with grandma now. He's all right. And you try and squash down what they're feeling. Whereas if you just let them, you just say, yes, he's really sad. I really miss him. And you really miss him. And they tell you how they're feeling. They're really sad. Yeah. And then he'll hop off and go and have an ice cream, kick his brother, you know, be an ordinary. So they hop in and out of puddles, sadness and happiness. Julia. Such... And that's what we need to do as adults too, by the way. Yeah. And it's such wonderful advice. Uh, uh, honestly, I can feel it inside me. That's going to help someone right now as a listening says It's going to help them. And check what your children understand Yeah, about where their grandfather is. Just check with them. Where, where do you think he is? What do you think has happened to him? But, but that actually, that's just a, a good principle for communication in life full stop, isn't it? It's like, 
before you start to sort of imprint a story or put your thing on, just find out what they currently believe. What is their, what's their reality? Um, and, and I found actually, because I think over the last few years, I've tried to undo what I did with the Sky story, um, which again, I, I'm not sure it's the most helpful thing. I, I think it has been, but I, I sort of feel when you're honest with kids, they kind of they get, get it. it. They get it better than we do. Like totally. I, I sort of feel kids are born with this kind of, they've got this reality, this understanding of life. We kind of educate them out of it. So suddenly then we've got these stories of the sky and this and stuff. And then all we're trying to do later is what you said was so beautifully simple. It's like, you just clearly, concisely tell them the reality and they sort of get it and process it. And there, it can be that simple, right? And, you know, if you're going to start fooling a section of the population, don't start with the under fours because they are truth seekers. They, you know, they know what's going on, even if they don't have the words to say it. They know when you're telling they the do. truth. They do. Yeah. And they need to trust you. They need to trust the truth that you're telling them. Yeah. Powerful advice. Julia, look, we've spoken for a long time. Oh, and no. Please don't apologize. I could have gone on for another hour. There's so much I want to unpack with you. Um, the podcast is called Feel Better, Live More. When we feel better in ourselves, we get more out of our lives. I think the tools and the tips you have for people, um, the stories you share, absolutely are going to help people get more out of their lives. And I wonder if right at the end of this show today, you could leave the listeners, leave the viewers with some of your most practical tips that they can start applying to improve the quality of their lives. I'd love to do that. I think, I think the first one is that when they're going through a process of change, they will feel abnormal and to not fight it, but to support themselves in it. And for them, you know, to find out what that looks like. For, so f for everybody, that will be different, what they need to support themselves. Um, for me, it is being self-compassionate. It is taking exercise. I kickbox. So a lot of what I do is, is about being empathic and still and in the moment. So really punching the, the life out of the guy I kickbox with is the reverse. So it really releases a lot of my kind of fury. So work out for each of you how you ex express what you feel in a way that works for yeah. you. And the thing that matters most that is the hardest to do is is love is the connection to others but it starts with the connection with yourself that how you are with yourself how you speak to yourself will impact how you build relationships with those around you but that is the thing that when people look at the at, at the end of their lives when people reflect on what matters to them most the thing that gives them meaning and purpose and happiness and health is the love and connection to others. So prioritize it. Wonderful words, wonderful insights, Julia. Thank you so much for making the journey here today. And I look forward to the next time we get to have our conversation. It was an absolute pleasure, Rangan. Thank you so much. Press subscribe to get more inspiration and ideas on how to feel better so you can get more out of life. And if you have a moment, why not check out this conversation that I've picked out as a perfect follow-up. Remember, lifestyle change is always worth it because when you feel better, you live more.